Thank you, Greg. So yes, um, I did formerly work at the Dennis Hopper Art Trust. I don't pretend to be objective at all about this. Um, so yeah, I helped to manage and arrange ex uh, exhibits of his personal ephemera and his artwork, um, primarily his artwork. And I think we all know Dennis Bess is a really incredible singular actor, but he was also a passionate artist uh, and an especially skilled photographer. Um, and I just want to show you a few of those here. Um, he was really everywhere in the 60s, uh, documenting everything and everybody. So he's with Timothy Leary, he's with some Hells Angels, some um, hippies in San Francisco. Here he is, photograph. well, it's, you don't see him, but these are his photographs of um, some, you know, very up-and-coming artists at that time, Roy Lichtenstein, Robert Rauschenberg, Ed Roche, Klaus Oldenburg, Alan Capro. Um, this is his photograph of Andy Warhol. Um, you might see this around. And there's Andy's portrait of him. Um, and these are his photographs of Ike and Tina Turner, James Brown, the birds. Um, here is a picture, some pictures from his travels in Mexico. And there are many, many, many more. Um, so I just wanted to show you those to show this sort of eye that he has, uh, this attention to different kinds of people and scenery and things that I think show up in Easy Rider. Um, and because not everyone knows that he was uh, this kind of photographer, an artist. But um, I could totally just do a presentation on him and his Dionysian aspects, but we're going to focus on Easy Rider. Um, so Easy Rider is a mythic movie in that there are many myths about it, about its making, um, usually revolving around who did or did not do what and who should and should not have credit for what. Um, and Dennis Hopper is a mythic figure himself. His life is full of legendary stories, some beautiful, some mad, some both. And I think this is all kind of fitting because the Western is a genre of tall tales. Um, it wants its legends, and it wants its larger-than-life icons, and Easy Rider delivered these on a chrome platter. It's been classed in various revisionist Western subgenres, uh, machine Western, psychedelic or acid Western, uh, literally in this case, uh, Vietnam Western, in which traditional tropes and characters are repurposed to critique or reflect upon contemporary lawmen, outdated heroes, and oppressed people and to further dismantle the project of Manifest Destiny as it spread into Vietnam. So all of these subgenres arrived in the 60s, the decade of free love and freedom writers. Uh, the 60s is probably our most inescapable decade. I didn't live through it, and I still feel that way. Um, it's kind of the creme de la creme of the American love for fetishizing um, and mythologizing the last millennium. But the 60s continues surviving this threat of exhaustion because it's a distinctive uh, mythic age. Each era is a genre unto itself, but the 60s are kind of particularly stylized and monumental. And it's a mythic age of turmoil and transcendence, of real strife and harmony, um, powers demanding sacrifice for unjust war, and this new audacity of the refusal to be sacrificed. It was the Bacchic decade. Is this happening OK? All right. Um, an explicit revival of the Greco-Roman god Bacchus, or Dionysus, uh, the god of freedom, who liberates the oppressed. He's the wild god of nature, who wanders the land with the wind in his long hair, celebrating free sexuality, loud music, and distributing mind-altering substances. He brings ecstasy and community, but also dismemberment and madness. Um, the only specific destination the Easy Rider guys have in mind when they set out uh, is Mardi Gras, of course, the mass carnival of social inversion and joy before suffering. And this grew out of the old Dionysian festivals over many, many years. The Mardi Gras sequence was the first shoot of the film. Uh, it was a rush job with a shoestring crew, including Seymour Castle, who served as a cameraman. Um, and it was marred by some real notorious madness from Dennis Hopper. So it all began and ended in some kind of dismemberment. Dionysus is also the god of theater, the ancestor of the movies. And he's the god of comedy, but also tragedy. And Easy Rider has a lot of both, of high peaks and big crashes. Um, I looked up the etymology of the word carnival. 
and it's from the Latin carne lavare, which, excuse any bad pronunciation there, but it means farewell to flesh, meaning that the winter reserves need to be eaten up before they rot, but which I think we can also read to mean um, a last hurrah of life, bodily life. So Easy Rider was made in the uprising year of 1968, shot between Mardi Gras and the assassination of RFK. It was definitely a decade of assassinations. Um, and the assassinations in the film represent in part the desaddling of this generation, the hippie generation, as Dionysus's ancient followers were also eventually murdered for their lifestyle. The hippies are the most familiar 60s archetype, uh, whose Eden was the Haight-Ashbury district. And perhaps you know this, but for a time, the guardians of this Eden were, of all things, the Hell's Angels. They were also the security detail for the Altamont Free Concert that ended in disaster a few months after Easy Rider's premiere. So this is sort of the classic end of the 60s, 1969 trifecta. Easy Rider, Altamont, and the Manson murders one month after Easy Rider's premiere. Um, Charles Manson wanted Dennis Hopper to play him in a movie about his life, and uh, Hopper did refuse that role. So Easy Rider engages this mythic motif of end times by forecasting the end of the 60s. So it's a movie about the end of the era and an end of time. And you might have noticed this theme of time throughout the movie. Um, right before Born to be Wild and the credits kick in, Peter Fonda's character throws away his watch in front of uh, a bunch of ruins that kind of resemble tombstones. When they're at the commune, the hitchhiker tells him time's running out. He gives him acid for the right time and suggests that he might want to stay. I'm hip about time, he replies, but I've got to go. So the idea is to escape time, to leave this measurement of life behind. The only time that matters is making it to Mardi Gras on time and doing things on their own time, as he praises the rancher for doing. And this also all plays into the Western genre, uh, its constant tension between settling down and keeping moving. So it's really interesting to me that they'd move forward not by uh, riding into the traditional Western sunset, but by heading eastward ho, uh, in a sense moving back in time, running the genre in reverse, and arriving like time travelers to towns that are not so familiar with their kind. Several scenes uh, transition with flash cuts, flashing between the present and the future before landing into the next scene, which kind of draws consciousness forward before its time, and I think just again emphasizes that this is a movie um, about a time shift. And then of course there's the prophetic vision, the flash that strikes um, Wyatt in the house of blue lights as he's surrounded by these eerie messages about death and God. All paths of glory lead to the grave, and death closes a man's reputation and determines it as good or bad. So that foreshadows their deaths, uh, but it also ushers in this mystery initiation, um, another kind of Dionysian death and rebirth experience that they have in the New Orleans streets and the bad trip in the cemetery. But I don't think their deaths really do d clearly determine their lives as good or bad. Uh, and this, again, fits the Western film, folklore, and history, um, in which the lines between good and bad guys and lawmen and rebels are blurry. The two main characters are relatively unknown, with ambiguous motivations. Really, only Jack Nicholson's character has any backstory um, that's given. So they're kind of like the stoner evolution of the Western man-with-no-name archetype. Too much exposition of character, plot, or meaning was intentionally withheld by Hopper. Uh, he was inspired by the French New Wave and believed that audience, audiences should not get all that they want, that they're accustomed to wanting, but just what they need. Just enough so that, as he said, you're comfortable crossing the country with these guys and affected by losing them in the end, which I think we are. What we are given are references. Um, Billy and Wyatt, their names in the film, refer to the historical frontier legends of Billy the Kid and Wyatt Earp. Billy the Kid uh, also died 88 years to the day of Easy Rider's U.S. premiere, 138 years ago today. So you can pour one out for Billy later. Um, so he was like Hopper's character and to an extent Hopper himself, a uh, merry prankster kind of guy, positively childlike but also given to some moody paranoia and forceful self-centeredness. 
Hopper had previously played Billy the Kid in a Michael McClure play, and the film within a film in the last movie, which is his infamous movie after Easy Rider, is about Billy the Kid. So he has some magnetism to this character. Peter Fonda's character has two names, Wyatt and Billy's nickname for him of Captain America. Wyatt Earp was an outlaw lawman, a convicted thief, but also marshal of Tombstone and Dodge City, where Hopper was born and raised. In later life, he carried out some shady tasks uh, for the LAPD, and between, uh, he did that in between actually consulting on early Western movies and hanging out with John Ford. So the, the Western, I give a little bit more of an intro about the genre for the first uh, screening, but it really did, the Western movies really did kind of ride right out of the frontier onto the screen. And he's an example of that. And Wyatt is also a poignant name choice for uh, Peter Fonda's character because his father, Henry Fonda, had played Wyatt Earp in Ford's 1946 film, My Darling Clementine. So Captain America is the carrier. He carries the money and whoever they pick up along the way. Uh, he's the stoic, handsome optimist who never wanted to be anybody else. But he's also the one who breaks down, uh, who sees the premonition and who is to some degree changed. Uh, he changes clothes during their migration while Billy maintains his David Crosby frontier outfit. Hopper intended Wyatt as a, quote, aesthetic guy, looking into the light, touching a leaf, and so on, while keeping his lines to a minimum to maintain mystery for himself. Wyatt was the sheriff riding the range and Billy the outlaw element, uh, who would nevertheless lay down his life for Captain America. And you can see that kind of affection in a few scenes. So they're the archetypal dynamic duo, uh, the loner travel buddies. Um, Hopper gave the analogies of a squire and his knight, or Sancho and Don Quixote, um, the comic book hero Captain America and his sidekick buddy, Bucky. Sorry, I don't know the comics as well. Um, Fonda and Hopper were also half-brother-in-laws for a while, uh, including at this time. Together, they deliver, they deliver the casualness and the orneriness that typifies the Western hero. And they're a mashup of frontiersman and biker. They wear different styles of cowhide. A Western with a motorcycle instead of horse. Wyatt wears spurs. They fix their tires as the ranchers fix their horseshoes. They're lassoed by a cowboy in the Texas parade as they're also roped in by the cops. Uh, and we see lots of Old West standbys. The desert, ranch, trail, whorehouse, jail, Catholicism, and the campfire. Uh, the inebriation has changed quite a bit, uh, from liquor to copious amounts of marijuana, uh, except for George, and when they go to Mardi Gras, they do have some wine. And they carry no weapons, except Billy's uh, useless knife and his deadly middle finger. They don't see vengeance. There are no gunfights or honorable duels. The violence comes in the middle of the night or passing by in a truck violations of the frontier justice code that to kill in self-defense or punish a crime was justifiable homicide, but to kill unarmed was murder. The old rivalry of cowboys and Indians is only a game that Billy plays with the kids. They camp on sacred ground, but the natives are dead beneath them. So their wild frontier is the Bible Belt. Their heist is no bank or train robbery or laboring away for precious gold, but a contemporary score, a drug deal of the ambiguous white substance from the happy cantina junkyard. Not the climax of the movie, but it's inciting event. So they're outlaws, but they're most of all outcasts, strangers in every place that they visit. I'm not sure if you're familiar with these movies, but um, the Western outlaw motif was picked up by outlaw biker movies uh, that were also important precedents for Easy Rider. Though Easy Rider is a much different kind of biker movie, and very intentionally so. Um, all three of this movie's stars were previously in westerns and in these exploitation biker flicks. 1969 marked 100 years since the Iron Horse or the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. And motorcycles are kind of another metal horse. They're fast and loud, like a new model of Dionysus's roaring chariot drawn by lions and tigers a staple of the parades that always joined this god, as our characters also join more than one parade themselves. 
So the Western and the bike flick that share the road, the need of the road. Uh, and this was a real road movie. After returning from Mardi Gras, they took the rest of the trip uh, in real time as they filmed it. Outlaws on two remodeled former LAPD bikes. So what comes with the road is freedom, and freedom is what it's all about, man. That campfire scene with George next to the swamp. Billy and Wyatt are not heroic outlaws, but they're not killers either. They demand their place, but there's no room for them at the end, and mostly they just mosey along. People are scared of the freedom that they represent, George explains. A real free individual scares people. It makes them dangerous. They'll talk about being free, insist that they are, but tell them they're not, and they'll kill to prove otherwise. And of course, he's all too right, because that's what happens that night, and he's the one who dies. Watching this again a few times now in 2019, uh, it really hits you how relevant this speech still is 50 years later. So George is the dude, uh, the American boy, maybe even the symbol of America in the movie, with his football helmet, college sweatshirt, father issues, and drinking problems. So I think the movie really lifts when uh, Jack comes on screen. He brings uh, humor and depth and somebody to really love uh, and really lose. He's also an ACLU LU lawyer. Uh, he's actually fighting for freedoms. And though he's in jail to protect himself from himself, it's also a misgiving place to find a man with his job. Also, I don't know if you noticed I pulled this out. But right across from the jail is um, a bar called the White House Club. I thought it was interesting. <laughs> Uh, so the ACLU made a lot of very progressive moves in the 60s, defending rights for all kinds of people, black, gay, women, artists, and filmmakers. Uh, Billy and Wyatt are arrested for parading without a permit in this scene, and that's something that Hopper also knew a bit about, because these are his photos from when he marched with MLK in Alabama. So he was there for that, too. George knows that they're lucky that they weren't razored, which was a real threat at that time in those parts, and that they'd be dead if they weren't white. So he knows what freedom means because he knows its risk. So I don't know about you, but I think they could have done a little better to mourn George a little more. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like the biggest moral failing in the movie to me. They pull his sleeping bag over his head, they promise to get his cash to his family, and then they take the whorehouse card, uh, particularly Billy. Uh, George and the hitchhiker character, another really good character played by Luke Askew, are these psychopomp characters. They give warning and riddles and boons that lead to transformative, uh, even death experiences. When they leave Mardi Gras, it's sunrise, the total opposite of sunset. Two duck hunters approach in their own machine, pull a gun, Billy shoots the finger, and they shoot him. Captain America drapes his flag jacket on him like a fallen soldier, and then he's killed like a sitting duck, too, with the great bike flying off the road. The camera zooms up like souls leaving their bodies, and that's it. It's a tragedy to just reckon with, and that's what Hopper wanted. Um, you know the value of freedom most when you don't have it or when you lose it. So Easy Riders about being killed for being free and different are being killed because you can be killed. Uh, they're outsiders. They're aliens flying along in their chrome machines. So that campfire scene with Jack when he tries marijuana or pretends that he's trying marijuana for the first time, uh, and Billy sees the UFO, and George unloads all this conspiracy theory in detail. Um, that's a really funny scene, but it's also really brilliant because they are basically like UFOs themselves. They live and breed among us. An antiquated society panics over accepting these creatures as real, and evolving toward equality. And of course, there's also uh, a, you know, a comedified <laughs> metaphor in here about all the unwanted people that the government uh, refuses to recognize as real life. I think he's also maybe kind of describing the dream that the, the commune people had in a way. In a way. So the name Easy Rider uh, was chosen by Terry Southern, who is the screenplay's co-writer or the primary writer. This is a big debate. Um, he wrote Dr. Strangelove and Barbarella with Jane Fonda. Um, but Easy Rider means a man who lives off of a prostitute. It's not the pimp, but it's the man that she lives with, uh, who lives off of her suffered earnings. And in Hopper's view, Lady Liberty was being written this way. 
And uh, he was very adamant that we must realize that freedom doesn't come free, but with great responsibility. It, can be, it can't be taken for granted or bogarted, but continually, vigilantly fought for and shared. So while their characters represent freedom and they are victims of hate, uh, Hopper and Fonda were also very clear in interviews that these are flawed heroes uh, because they too took the easy ride, uh, the easy money. They bought the drugs that the drug pusher would push, hard drugs that Easy Rider actually helped to popularize, uh, stuffed it into the American flag teardrop gas tank as their fuel, and took off for Mardi Gras with the final destination of a nice early retirement in Florida. So they thought that freedom could be bought. They don't break out cash to help the starving hippies. Uh, they, they're on their own trip, heading into what would be called the me generation. Hardly anybody in the film is pure. The hippies are kind of pathetic and parodied. The southerners lean all the way into their prejudice, and the main characters have their serious flaw, even if it doesn't deserve to be fatal. So it's a story of culture clash. And of course, the two gas tanks in the end, their two designs uh, merge. They were our flag and flames, and the money burns up. We blew it, Wyatt says, against Billy's enthusiasm during their last campfire. And it's a line that's confused a lot of people, but Hopper indicated that it's about how they could have done better things with that money, and that at any moment America can blow up, as it felt to be in the late 60s. I think he also feels some kind of existential spiritual failing. A man went looking for America and couldn't find it anywhere. That's what's on the poster. So even though Amer Captain America is emblazoned with its insignias, he can't find it because it's not what he thought he was looking for. So that's at least part of the intention uh, behind Easy Rider, and it casts everything in a much more complex light than I saw in early viewings of the film. Um, its impact doesn't necessarily glean all of that, I don't think. Uh, maybe it did for all of you. But I think that's okay. Um, a little personal mythology here. My dad very much wanted me to show this. Uh, if you know, Mad Magazine is, will be ending publication. Uh, and he grew up with that and had me grow up with that. Um, and I bring this up because I think myth is a lot about ancestry. And this movie, Easy Rider, was a, is a top favorite of my dad's. Um, it's what he calls a high impression movie. And this poster, I grew up with this hanging in every space that we lived in. It was like a religious icon in my house. I don't know if you can really see it, but that pin is from the era as well, and it says, draft beer, not students. Um, he missed the draft by a month. So I saw this for years before seeing the actual movie. Uh, and then later on, a friend found this version and bought it for me, and now it hangs in every space I live in. So it's a sacred object, and it's powerful to hang in love because this is the point of view of the shooter. Uh, so it's kind of like a modern psychedelic crucifix, in a way. It's iconic, and that's something that Easy Rider definitely is. It's an archetype that many have been driven to channel, to get a bike and ride free. Um, so I asked my dad a few days ago, what does he feel like the real takeaway of the movie is? And he said, the freedom of the road. And I think that that's true, that even while it offers this counterpoint, uh, a really important counterpoint about the lack of freedom, I feel like what sticks with people is the feeling and the value of freedom. Uh, that feeling on a motorcycle is really visceral. It's a great way to roar against your trauma. You automatically feel like some kind of outlaw, but also like some kind of poet, because it's a really immersive, reflective experience. You point things out more than you talk, and that's a great thing about motorcycles. They shut you up. Uh, but then what's often even more transcendent is when you combine that movement with music. And I think that's where the real feeling of freedom that people get out of Easy Rider comes from, is its use of music. Also, by the way, I'm sure you could hear the music very well. I really hope you could hear the dialogue okay. I know it was a bit of a struggle. We had some sound issues, um, but everyone was all right? Okay. <laughs> I know you could hear the songs. Uh, so Easy Rider, it's not the first movie to use popular music as its soundtrack. Uh, Kenneth Anger did that. The Graduate used Simon and Garfunkel music. But it was the first to do this on such a major level. Um, and it ushered in a whole new way that, use it, that music was used in film. And it probably helped set the music video format into motion as well. 
So there's nothing like the way riding along on some kind of machine with your favorite songs playing sets you into reverie and into feeling like you're living your myth, mythologizing your condition. Because Easy Rider is an evolution of the Western, we can also consider its soundtrack an evolution of the cowboy ballad tradition, uh, now with new folk rock balladeers like Bob Dylan. So the horse hopra, as early Western movies were called, was becoming this kind of hog rock. Hopper and uh, the editor Don Camburn played music from their record collections while they were editing. The bike footage and these placeholders fit so well that they became permanent. Originally, Crosby, Stills, and Nash were supposed to do the soundtrack. Uh, according to them, they didn't feel that they could beat these placeholder songs. According to Hopper, they arrived to the meeting in a limo, and anyone who rides in a limo can't understand his damn movie, so <laughs> get out. <laughs> oh, by the way, yeah, I forgot to put this in here. Um, another interesting little Hollywood mythos about the making of the movie, um, Easy Rider was funded by the guys who created the Monkees TV show. Uh, and who produced the Monkees movie called Head, which Jack, Jack Nicholson co-wrote. So in a way, this movie was made with uh, monkey music money. <laughs> uh, and in a way, Jack, you know, Jack kind of makes the movie, and he helped to make the movie on this level as well. I think he may have recommended it to the producers. And this movie made him. He was ready to quit acting and just, just be behind the scenes before Easy Rider. So anyway, in a ballad, the sentiment is as important as the action. And I think these songs convey the mythic conditions of the film as well as any plot device could. The first song is Steppenwolf's The Pusher, about how dealing and doing drugs is fine in their view, but drug pushers don't care if users live or die. Some lyrics are, if I were president of this land, you know I'd declare total war on the pusher man. Shoot him if he'd run, kill him with my Bible, my razor, and my gun all relevant weaponry to the movie, and a song that kind of absolves the main characters of their part in the game. And this is right after the drug deal under the roar of the airplanes, uh, which is funny because uh, this buyer is played by Phil Spector, who invented the wall of sound. <laughs> Lots of little details like that. So then it's Born to be Wild, the real famous one, uh, as they set off on their journey. Lots of Dionysian language in this one. Smoke, lightning, thunder, setting out for whatever comes your way, climb so high, never want to die. But then it's also, all, also ultimately foreshadowing. Um, fire all of your guns at once and explode into space. Kind of uncanny. Wasn't born to follow by the birds. Not born to follow, born to be wild. A uh, pleasant song echoing the prisms of light that Hopper and cinematographer Laszlo Kovacs welcomed into the camera on many occasions, uh, where rivers of our visions flow into one another, all the things I'll lose that really have no value. So things are feeling good as they're riding along, going skinny dipping. The Weight uh, by the band. This is a really gorgeous sequence riding into Monument Valley, into Nazareth, a uh, home of the divine child, a place of pilgrimage. This is where John Ford really cemented the image of the Western landscape and where Peter's father played Wyatt Earp. So the weight is about taking on the burden that others have unloaded from themselves. And I imagine this was very palpable to Peter Fonda. Um, but it also evokes the weight of the Western genre and Western history and the struggle of a new generation to shoulder its burdens. It's also a sequence where the sunset's very prominent and they marvel at it all. Two playful numbers uh, that still have these sort of underscoring lyrics. If you wanna be a bird by Holy Modal Rounders and Don't Bogart Me by Fraternity of Man. Uh, the first is about getting out and flying. Don't wait for heaven to come to you, go to heaven. Make figure eights through the pearly gates. The second is about not bogarting a joint. Uh, essentially, don't hoard the good things for yourself as they were in a sense doing and this cuts powerfully into If Six Was Nine by Jimi Hendrix. So if everything turns upside down, the sun refuses to shine, all the hippies cut off all their hair, you still got your own world to live. Individual freedom can be had without being taken from anybody else. And I think people forget that. And then the saints come marching into Mardi Gras. And you might have noticed a lot of Christian themes uh, and omens throughout the movie. 
So after Wyatt has his acid meltdown, crying to his mother, uh, his real mother did kill herself when he was young, and Hopper kind of forced him to channel that in that scene. Um, or he might have been crying to Lady Liberty, the motherland. Um, they take their last ride to Bob Dylan's It's All Right, Ma. And this is performed by Roger McGuinn because Dylan felt that the movie lacked the proper hope and revenge. Um, so with any Dylan song, there's a lot more poetry than we can cover right now, but there are a lot of relevant lines about a lack of the sacred, dodging the rules of the road, not faulting those who live in a vault. Uh, but I think he not busy being born is busy dying, is the real line for this movie, because it reminds us of that beginning, uh, of the fresh sense of being born and how that's lost along the way. So I think the sentiment of this song at that moment is really haunting. The final song is a ballad. It's called The Ballad of Easy Rider, written for the movie. Uh, its first line was written by Bob Dylan, and then he handed it off to uh, McGuinn to finish. And the sentiment of this one always feels kind of odd to me, a little off, but in a sweet way. So the river flows, it flows to the sea, and wherever that river flows, that's where I want to be. Flow, river, flow, take me from this road to some other town. All he wanted was to be free, and that's the way it turned out to be. I don't know if it really did, but that last helicopter shot uh, does something interesting. And it pans up from the, the road where they're killed, and you see that a trail connects that road to a river. Uh, Dylan called this God's Road, the original road that's always moving even if nothing is riding it. And this is, of course, the only song that they're not riding to. So that abrupt, shocking ending and then this instant expansion of perspective to the natural landscape that was there before this kind of human quarrel uh, from some kind of God's eye view. So Easy Rider, a movie about freedom, made with freedom, eliciting some degree of the feeling of freedom. They wanted it to be a depiction of real life, including all of the drug use. Um, it's got so much beautiful footage of everyday life. It kept the lens flares, uh, which it was somewhat criti uh, criticized for. Improvised dialogue, found music. Hopper embraced the accident. Uh, that was a lesson that he absorbed really passionately from Cocteau and Marcel Duchamp. So the film was thrown together fast enough, shot remotely enough, and with a budget small enough of about half a million that they could make it without oversight. It's itself a sort of outlaw, a very successful one. It premiered at Cannes, where it won Best Film by New Director and a rousing standing ovation. In the end, it pulled in almost 60 million. It made its money back in one week in one theater in New York. So Easy Rider is also about freedom because it created freedom for future creative filmmakers, at least for a time. Uh, more independent production companies were formed, like BBS, which was the company that grew out of Easy Rider. Uh, they went on to make five easy pieces with Jack Nicholson and Karen Black. Uh, they made the last picture show. So realizing that small budget movies could make big money, studios relinquished their control and let these directors make their art, which included Hopper. Uh, he was given final cut for the revisionist Western, the last movie. And the making of that is an entire Bacchic epic in itself and a movie for another time. But Easy Rider really kicked open the door to the new Hollywood and this director's decade of the 70s uh, that I hope to screen more films from in this series. And when I do, uh, we will thank Easy Rider for its lessons about freedom and its achievements of freedom. That is all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.